Hello everyone, welcome back to another Watch Me Do Math video. If you are new here, this is Watch Me Do Math. I'm a year 13 student from Hong Kong who makes maths and physics videos three times a week on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays at 6 p.m. Hong Kong time. In today's video, we're going to be going over integral from no bounds of 1 over x minus k with respect to x. So, how do we go about this? Um, this video is going to be focused on if you are someone taking further peer mathematics in year 11 and this integral, which was something that I used in my video about Newton's law of cooling, struck you as being interesting. This will also be a good introduction to thinking about calculus in a more abstract way using things like substitution in the context of integrals when previously you might have only used substitution in calculus in the differentiation chain rule. So how might we go about this? Well, firstly, let's look at the integral of 1 over x with respect to d, dx, with respect to x. This integral is harder to figure out if you do not know the answer originally. And this is because of the way that the power rule works. You're basically integrating x to the power of negative 1 with respect to x. And in doing this, you might think, okay, so by the power rule, it must be 1 over 0 times x to the 0 plus c. Well, the thing is, x to the 0 is constant, so its integral would be 0, not x to the negative 1. And secondly, 1 over 0 is undefined. That doesn't work either. So what's the deal? Well, What we can do here is try and differentiate ln x. Why do I suddenly pull this out? Because ln x, believe it or not, can be differentiated to get 1 over x. Now this might sound like some definition that you need to learn in a formula booklet if it was ever in further pure IGCSE maths. And for all I know, it could possibly be with a new syllabus, but I'm not so sure about that. Anyway, if y is equal to ln x, what would you do about it? Because ln x is such a, it's such a simple function, and yet you wouldn't know the, the route you take to get from this to this. So consider the following. Raise both sides to the to be a power of e, such that e to the y is equal to e to the ln x. Resolving both sides here, you get e to the y is equal to x. Now, how is this useful? Well, something we can do is differentiate both sides with respect to y. So on this side, e to the y becomes e to the y. We're putting it through the operator d over dy. Differentiating something with respect to y is very similar to differentiating something with respect to x. You're just changing the variable you're looking at when you differentiate. So how might you deal with x when you're differentiating with respect to y? Well, the thing to use here is actually the chain rule. Because you know x is equal to e to the power of y. x is some function that takes y as input, for instance. This could be one way of looking at x. And you already know that if you have some function that takes another thing as input, then you can use the chain rule. These are two examples of that. So what we're actually going to do here is we're going to get, let x be some variable that is in terms of y. And first we're going to differentiate by x. and then we're going to multiply this differential by dx over dy. 
which is our equivalent of du by dx, if x was u and y was x, as in Think about differentiating x squared with the chain rule, or x, x to the fourth with the chain rule. x to the fourth could be looked at as u squared, where u is some function of x, and differentiating that with respect to u multiplied by du by dx still gets you to d by dx of u squared. That's how you can take the differential of something with respect to another something even when that other something is not present in the original expression. You can still figure out that this is equal to 2u times well if u is x squared that's 2x or 4x cubed if you make the calculation to its end. So in this case we're actually finding dx by dy which we don't know what it is. We want to make this the subject of our equation. We don't know what it is yet, but we know that differentiating x with respect to y must get us this result. d by dx of x multiplied by dx over dy. So if we move this down here, e to the y is equal to d by dx of x times dx over dy. And given that the differential of x with respect to x, or this term, is just 1, then we can remove it from our multiplication and ignore it because 1 times anything is anything. e to the y is equal to dx over dy. Now I want you to think about what dx over dy actually means for a moment. Because our goal, anyway, is dy over dx. We wanted to differentiate ln x, which was y, by x. We wanted d by dx of y, or d by dx of ln x, is another way of looking about it. What does dx and dy actually mean? Well, if you go to the original definition of a differential, it is the slope of a line at a particular point. Calculus is to do with change in this way, and d being the Roman version of a delta, and the lowercase 2 the capital delta that is used when denoting large measurable changes in something, this d represents an infinitesimal, meaning infinitely small, change in a quantity. So when the gradient of a straight line might be delta y over delta x over a large range for which we know visually that the gradient is constant, dy by dx represents the tiniest, most infinitely small change in y divided by the change in x that corresponds to it. So while dy by itself is technically zero, and while dx by itself is technically zero, dy by dx makes some measurable quantity that's on a reasonable scale, like 3, 4, 100, minus 2, whatever, but not zero. So, while mathematically it might not be sound to treat these as individual values in the most pure sense, you can still manipulate them as if dy over dx were a fraction in some cases. Because dy represents a change in y, it's some it's some actual quantity, and dx represents the change in x that corresponds to the change in y that you just saw. Another way of thinking about it is by going back to the very first definition of the derivative that you might have learned. Because 
in taking the slope between two points. You'd have one point, which was f of x, or x comma f of x, because this is the x coordinate and this is the y coordinate function of x, and then incrementing x by some change h, which is equal to dx. You'd get your dy x plus h f x plus h. And the derivative of a function is when h goes to zero, because you want these two points to be as close as possible to make sure that your line passing through these points is as accurate to the actual slope of the graph as possible. So in a sense, this fx plus h minus fx, where h is taken to go towards zero, becomes fx minus fx. But it still represents the quantity of the infinitesimal change in y, even though mathematically it's equal to zero, which is why it can kind of be manipulated as a fraction. And in this scenario, what we're going to do is we're going to take the reciprocal of both sides, or if you're uncomfortable with that idea, taking the reciprocal just means inverting the fraction of both sides, taking both sides to the power of negative one. We are multiplying this side, we're multiplying both sides by one, and dy, and then we're dividing both sides by dx and e to the power of y, or flipping the fraction as you might visualize it. So e to the y over 1 is equal to dx by dy goes to 1 over e to the y is equal to dy by dx. And I just want to make a note here, differentiating with respect to y or x individually using this sort of quote-unquote chain rule that we just did. While the chain rule might apply to all cases, what we're doing here is something else known as implicit differentiation because we're not making some dummy variable u. We're using the variable y which is already there in a function of x. For instance, differentiating y with respect to x is equal to the differential with respect to y multiplied by dy over dx. While this is not something that is introduced to you in further pure explicitly by your teacher, as in you won't be told, hello everyone, today we're learning implicit differentiation. It is something that shows up later in mathematics courses, and it is something that is also still really useful for further pure problems, especially for things like um, areas, radiuses, volumes, whatever, etc. Because, for instance, if you think about it, say a is pi r squared, for instance, and you want to know the rate of change of a at a particular r, right? So what you're really doing is taking the derivative with respect to time of both sides. So dA by dt would be equal to d by dr, this times dr by dt, or dA by dt is equal to 2 pi dr by dt, and so on. You can do this kind of manipulation of the formulas that describe 3D shapes to great advantage in the kind of problems that you see in further pure. Anyway, this was a bit of a side note, so let's get back to the original problem. 1 over e to the y is equal to dy by dx, and e to the y, as we know, is x, so dy by dx is x. We've established that the differential, or is 1 over x, sorry, because it's 1 over e to the y. So we've established that the differential of ln x with respect to x is 1 over x. So that means integrating it must get us to integrating 1 over x dx ought to get us to ln x plus c. But what's this? What have I drawn here? Absolute value signs. Now why is that? Well, let me just explain. 
the ln function is a function that is defined over all positive real numbers except 0, if you consider 0 to be positive. It looks something like this, crossing the x-axis at 1 and continuing on in this manner. But 1 over x is a function that is defined for all real numbers except 0. It looks like this. So, what's happening here? Well, think about it this way. If this is the integral of x, if this is valid as being the integral of 1 over x over positive x's, then surely there must be a way of thinking about the integral of 1 over x for negative x's, right? If there is some integral from a to b over the positive realm of 1 over x dx, integral from a to b of 1 over x dx, this will become ln b minus ln a, or ln b over a. And so what if you had this, this symmetric area, which is um, otherwise negative. Being negative is the only thing that makes it different from this area here. Well, if this area is equal to ln b over a, or minus ln b over a, it becomes ln a over b by the rules of logarithms. And that's because when you have the ln of something that is multiplied by a particular number, in this case n is negative 1, this becomes ln x to the power of n. And that follows on from the power rule, whereby basically a to the m plus, uh, or a to the m times a to the n is equal to a to the m plus n. If you took log a of all of these things, m plus n would be equal to log m plus log n would be equal to log I I'm kind of in a poor state to explain that logarithm law, so if you have any questions about that, just let me know, but it is based on this. And see if you can prove it for yourself, because I can't think of a good explanation right now, right now to be honest. So, if minus ln b over a is equal to ln a over b, because it's b over a to the power of negative 1 inside the bracket, and we're dealing with minus b and minus a here. Then we're told that the integral from minus b to minus a of 1 over x dx, where these minuses cancel out because they're on the top and bottom of the fraction. They're both they're both factors of negative 1, basically. This minus b to minus a of 1 over x dx is equal to ln a over b, or basically the integral from minus a to minus b of 1 over x dx from the fact that swapping these around gives you the negative of the original integral because instead of moving in dx's from the right, so you go from like negative b 
and then dx, 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 and so on to negative a, because that's what dx means. It's a continuous sum, that's what the integral sign is for, continuous sum of the infinitesimal change in x multiplied by 1 over x. And instead of going in this direction, you're going in the other direction, from minus a to minus b, so dx, dx, dx. In this case, dx is negative, so it's like minus dx, right? And the minus sign, which is multiplied by dx, this factor of negative 1, moves out to the outside, which is why it's equal to the negative of from minus b to minus a. And just making sure that's what we're doing, yeah. Negative minus b for, to minus a, 1 over x dx. Or minus ln a over b. Which, from that power rule we talked about early, earlier, already becomes ln b over a. It's the same. We've now shown that the integral from a to b of 1 over x dx is equal to the integral from minus a to minus b of 1 over x dx. No matter what a and b are, over the real possible values of a and b, except zero. So that's where the absolute value sign comes from. They're equal going over the same side. Because ultimately, you're integrating this area in this direction, which is symmetrical to integrating this area in this direction. And so you get the same result. That's why there is ln absolute value of x. As opposed to just the regular ln of x, because 1 over x is defined over this entire space. So now that we've very well established that the integral of 1 over x dx is ln x, what do we do now? Well, let's go back to where our original question of 1 over x minus k dx. Oh, and by the way, don't forget the plus c. Integral of 1 over x dx is equal to ln absolute value of x plus c. What we can do here is use u substitution, which is a kind of technique that is basically like the chain rule, but for integrals. And u substitution here means that we're going to take something u and let it be equal to some part of this integral and we're going to be letting it equal to x minus k because we want it to sim we want to simplify it to our original form so then we get 1 over u dx but that doesn't really help us because how can we integrate a function in terms of u with respect to x well we need to find a a value of dx in terms of du right so if u is x minus k, how can we introduce du's into the mix and dx's into the mix? Well, we differentiate both sides by x. Differentiating u by dx gets us du over dx. And differentiating x minus k with respect to x is rather easy. It just gets us 1. So multiplying both sides by dx, we get du is equal to dx. So we swap out this dx for a du directly. We don't need to make any more adjustments from the integral for the integral, even though that might be what you need to do. It becomes the integral of 1 over u du, which we already know will go to the ln of the absolute value of u plus c. Or, given that u is equal to x minus k, the ln of u or rather ln of x minus k plus c. And that's our final answer. So I hope that was quite enlightening for you to think about because this integral is really uh, one of the most interesting and important ones when it comes to when you first start learning about applying integrals and sort of differential equations to physics. Because this video is also intended as a kind of 
uh, prelude or introduction to my video about Newton's Law of Cooling, which is available elsewhere on my channel. It's got one of those two color thumbnails because it's both maths and physics. If you found this video helpful, please do subscribe to the channel. There are new videos coming out every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday at 6 p.m. Hong Kong time or 10 p.m. Universal, 10 a.m. Universal Coordinated Time on those days. And if you have any video requests that you'd like me to do, do leave them in the comments or email me at watchmedomath at gmail.com. Thank you for watching.